Uh, good evening. I'm Ken Bedell. I work in the U.S. Department of Education in the Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnership Center. So I'm delighted to be able to moderate this discussion about a topic that's of interest to all of us as Americans and particularly of interest to those of us who work in interfaith and uh, particularly it's of interest to me who works in the Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnership Center at the Department of Education. We're here this evening to discuss a really interesting and, and exciting book entitled Preventing Violence and Achieving World Peace, The Contribution of the Gulen Movement. And we have the two editors with us who I will introduce now and then they're each going to speak uh, uh, to describe some things uh, about the book and, and about the content of the book, and then we'll have a little bit of time for uh, discussion after that. So first, uh, Oris Saltis is the Goodman Professor, professorial lecturer in theology and fine arts at Georgetown University. He's a former director and curator of the Benath Brith Coltsman National Jewish Museum in Washington, D.C., where he curated over 80 exhibitions. He's taught and lectured throughout the country on subjects ranging from Arab-Israeli conflict to the body of ancient art. Both before and since his years at the museum, as the museum director, he has guest curated exhibitions across the United States and overseas. Professor Soltes was educated in classics and philosophy at Haverford College and classics at Princeton University and John Hopkins University and in interdisciplinary studies at Union University. His most recent books are Our Sacred Signs, How Christians, Jews, and Muslim Art Draw from the Same Source, the Ashram Rainbow Essays on the Arts and the Holocaust, Searching for Oneness, Mysticism in the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Traditions, and Untangling the Tangled Web, Why the Middle East is a Mess. Mm -hmm. But he's not going to talk about all of those books uh, mm -hmm. this evening, just the one. I I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Margaret Johnson, and then they'll just speak one after uh, another. Uh, she has a PhD, is a business owner, sociologist, researcher, and writer. She's currently on sabbatical after 12 years as the CEO and president of TransfireX, Translation Services Incorporated. She's using this time of sabbatical to write a book on the stories from the Hizmet movement. To that end, she has visited Hizmet organizations in nine countries and interviewed members of the movement at all levels from students to teachers to volunteers to regional and country leaders. Her interviews encompass volunteers who have served in many different countries, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Nigeria, Kyrgyzstan, Albania, Turkey, the United States, and Indonesia. Also, publishing in areas of nonprofit organizations, microcredit finance, and entrepreneurship. The th themes tying together her disparate works is how individuals come together to enact their ideas and visions. Currently, she serves as Senior Research Associate for the Institute is of Islamic and Turkish Studies in Fairfax, Virginia, and the academic program, and she's the academic programs coordinator for the Rumi Forum in Maryland. She's, uh, sh sh she blogs as well, so I want to uh, say welcome, and uh, we're eager to, to hear about the book. Okay. Uh, I've been slotted to go first, so therefore I will go first. Uh, but before I do so, um, we have one of the authors here this evening, do we not? Dr. Falkenberg, do you want to identify yourself? <laughs> so uh, that's in case there are questions that uh, Maggie and I don't want to deal with, we'll point you in his direction. <laughs> and uh, no refreshments for you unless you answer everything <laughs> correctly. Um, what I want to do is say a few words, first of all, about how this book came about, and then a few words, of course, about the book itself. It largely grew out of a conference that was organized at University of Maryland, um, the Rumi Forum there, that dealt with this subject, the, the matter of uh, 
preventing violence and developing peace and how the Gulen movement has been involved in that or as it has more recently and more appropriately come to be called the Hizmet movement and Maggie will be talking more about that word Hizmet and uh, what it means um, when I'm finished. The uh, conference extended over uh, a, a long day with a number of papers, some of which ended up not in the book, um, and there are papers in the book that didn't come from the conference. So it was the starting point, but not the totality of the book as it took shape. And the book itself really, um, in an obvious way, revolves around a number of different themes. The essays as we ultimately organize them kind of lead organically one into the next one might say so that the opening work deals with the relationship not only between preventing violence and achieving peace but specifically the role of education in um, achieving that end and the starting point for that essay which is my own is Socrates and what he brought to the table in Western thought at the beginning of philosophy in introducing ethics um, into what up to that point for philosophers had been primarily a focus on the natural world and how it functions and the question of what sort of elements precede and what sort of elements follow others um, in the physical making of the world. And in fact, the word virtue, arete in Greek, for Socrates' predecessors meant a kind of skill or a knack. So someone who is a good shoemaker has the arete, the virtue of shoemaking, and, and someone who is a good politician has the arete, or the virtue of being a politician. And he introduces into that idea um, a moral component, an ethical component, that to do particularly certain things well doesn't only, and perhaps not even necessarily at all, pertain to the physical aspect of what they are. There is a moral aspect, and that would raise particular issues, perhaps less in the field of carpentry and shoemaking, where the, sta the table stands or it doesn't, and the shoes fit or they don't, and they protect the wearer from the elements or they don't. And one might argue that if there is a moral component, and that's not really where he goes with this, that it would attach itself to how much the shoemaker or the carpenter charges you for a table that is more or less effective. But his concern was more in what we would call abstract issues. What is ultimately virtue? What is goodness? What is um, self-control? What is piety? What is holiness? Those are things which have no tangibility the way shoes and tables do. You can't point them out. You can't put your hand on them. And his question becomes, what do acts that we call pious, for example, all have in common with each other by virtue of which we call them pious? If we could determine that, then perhaps we could come up with a definition of piety. And that sort of a discourse is followed in the hands of his pupil Plato by the shaping of a school, or the idea of a school, an ideal school, in which ideal leaders would be educated to constantly think about these things, to constantly ask these questions, not to assume we know the answers without thinking about them, and with those kinds of leaders and with different elements of society playing their roles that the outcome would be an ideal kind of polity, an ideal politeia. Um, the work, of course, that focuses primarily on this is called Plato's Republic. Um, the unfortunate part of which is that the title is in Latin, not in Greek. But the idea of that title, even in Latin, is appropriate. Res publica in Latin means the people's thing. So a polity that represents all of the people's interests is the ideal toward which he's pushing. So the long and the short of it is, he's asking about the, or positing the, role of education in shaping leaders and a population that is disposed toward peace, by definition, and away from violence, by definition. And in that essay, um, 
that starting point then leads into the kind of world in which you and I and Fethullah Gulen live, which is a world much broader than that of Socrates and Plato. When all is said and done, they're mainly thinking about Athenians, sometimes they're thinking about Athenians and other Greeks. Rarely are they thinking about the world beyond the Greek world because to them that's a world that they don't understand. Its inhabitants speak languages that sound to their ears like bar, 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 from which, of course, the word barbaros in Greek comes, and the uh, English version of that is barbarian. So that's not a focus for them. But in the world in which you and I and Fethullah Gulen live, um, we are confronted by an endless range of languages, an endless range of ethnicities, races, religions, perspectives, points of view, cultures, um, which we need to take into our focus if we are then to promote the idea of peace and promote that in conjunction with a diminishment in violence. But education can be a very obvious way in which that is accomplished. And um, as I'm sure Maggie will amplify um, when I'm finished, one of the features that is endemic to the Gulen or Hizmet movement is the creation of schools that in fact cover a vast range of territory, a far greater range, by the way, than Plato or Socrates would have had in their ideal mind. For them, for example, arts were of no use. Um, for the Gulen movement school, arts are recognized as very important. Physical arts are recognized by the Greeks as important. They're certainly recognized by the Gulen movement as important. There is an endless range. Um, and that discussion kind of leads almost naturally into the discussion of the uh, next three essays in this volume. One of which, or the first of which, which is the essay by Hian Kim uh, about dialogic humanism, Gulen's alternative to dialectic thinking. So what, him do, what Kim does, in a nutshell, is to uh, present a contrast between what he presents as a kind of Hegelian idea that sees the world of ideas as moving from one pole to another pole, a thesis that is then confronted by its antithesis and the eventual resolution into some sort of a synthesis which becomes a new idea, a new thesis, which then produces its antipode and eventually there is a synthesis. But the idea you see that underlies Hegelian thinking, as Kim points out, is you're constantly dealing with oppositions. And that kind of dialectical thinking, which is dealing with oppositions and the question of how to resolve them, is, he suggests, replaceable by Gulenian thinking, which has to do not with dialectical opposition, but with dialogue. And dialogue involves, on the one hand, a comfortable sense of where one is coming from with respect to one's own language, one's own religion, one's own ethnicity, one's own culture, so that one feels comfortable with and not threatened by people coming from other ethnicities, other races, other religions, other cultures. So the dialogue becomes um, a matter of trying to understand each other as opposed to trying to convert each other. or trying to understand each other from within a framework that recognizes commonalities as the basic human truth, rather than the oppositional framework which is posited by Hegelianism. And in turn, uh, the two essays that follow these um, are one by uh, Imad Adin Ahmad, who is um, actually a, a professor here locally, um, that focuses on educational models, models that are all-encompassing or models that are not. And he recollects his own days as a student as one where uh, too often the theme was of misunderstanding or a lack of interest in understanding what others have to say. Um, what if one is a majority, in a majority setting, what minorities have to say, for example. And how, uh, in uh, distinction from that sort of model, uh, an educational world in which one tries to understand various groups on their own terms um, is important, as at the same time he brings in the matter of violence by way of the discussion of sports, 
which in the educational world of, in which he grew up, was really a matter of violence and a matter of conquests, whereas he offers the counter suggestion that sports um, can really function as not a means of uh, violent competition toward conquest as much as um, a non-hostile engagement on the physical plane that runs parallel to non-hostile hostile engagement on a kind of metaphysical or intellectual plane. Um, Professor Falkenberg's discussion is very specific to Gulen with respect to how one achieves peace through discussion, through dialogue, and the all important, important word tolerance, which he understands, Yulen understands, um, and everyday vocabulary in English as opposed to its equivalent in Turkish does not understand to be a matter of an even, even playing field of discussion. Tolerance, as that term is typically used in English, means I'm speaking from here down to you, down there. I tolerate you. Um, it's equivalent in, in Turkish, and um, its intention, as Gülen uses that term, which most of us read in English translations, and therefore uh, can get caught exactly in this network of misunderstanding, is more like the term embrace, which involves, uh, to repeat, a recognition of the, well, to put it in, 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 in particular terms, that as I am an I, and to me you are a you, you are an I, and to you I am a you. And the difference between I, you, you, I, which is a relationship, and I am an I, and you become an it, to me is that I don't relate to you, I experience you, and it's uneven. If I recognize the I, capital I-ness, in you, and you recognize it in me, and therefore we also recognize the you-ness in each of us, we end up with a relationship. If I fail to recognize that your I is as valid as mine, then you become an it and not a you and I experience you, I don't relate to you. That issue then in turn leads to a pair of essays, one by Thomas Block and one by Terry Mathis, that um, focus on interwoven and parallel um, telling tales which are part of both formal and informal educational processes. So Thomas Block, for example, his uh, essay, which is on shared Jewish and Muslim teaching tales, how they echo the contemporary Gula movement, um, is a journey through a series of different tales, fables, that are found in the two traditions. The one deriving it from the other, the other deriving it from the one, they're springing up simultaneously on the two sides of this fence that reflect um, common values with respect to the value of humans, all humans, and the respect that we can and should have with each other. And Terry Mathis's uh, essay um, takes a similar kind of path with respect to uh, related uh, elements of the Bible and the Quran where the, the, the same principle is engaged and invoked by him, which is the principle of shared values um, and the way in which, uh, on the one hand, diverse traditions can influence each other, but constantly in two directions, or on the other hand, um, run on parallel tracks, which individuals from a particular tradition may not realize and recognize as parallel to what are found in the other tradition or the other traditions, but which the whole point of his essay is, of course, to explore how they, they can and should be recognized. And the last two essays, um, one uh, is a second essay that, that, that I wrote that uh, actually compares five different mystical thinkers 
um, from five different traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam on the one hand, Hinduism, Buddhism on the other hand, where one might suppose because of the intensity of focus on particular methods and ways of gaining access to the innermost, hiddenmost recess of divinity, which is what the goal of mysticism ultimately is all about, or I should say the preliminary goal, um, because the ultimate goal is not to do that. The ultimate goal is to do that, and based on one's success at doing that, in returning from that experience and improving the world around one. So the true mystic is someone who doesn't seek enlightenment. The true mystic is one who seeks enlightenment in order to benefit the world around him or her. And one might suppose, because each of these traditions has very specific and particular means and methods to achieving that, that a mystic would be even less susceptible to um, interfaith thinking than a non-mystic. But in fact, in instances uh, such as are brought up in, in this essay, it turns out to be quite the opposite. And the reason for that becomes rather obvious when one steps back and understands what one has to accomplish in order to be a successful mystic. If I am to be filled with God, the only, then the only way that that can happen is if I empty myself of myself, my ego. Now, the challenge to me as a mystic is that if I've emptied myself of self to be filled with God, can I regain myself? If I can't, then I can't come back and I can't benefit the world around me. I go mad, or I drop dead, or I apostatize. That's the challenge, that's the danger. But on the other hand, if I can accomplish that, it positions me to improve the world without doing so based on my own ego. That's the thing. And every religious tradition throughout its history is filled with religious leaders who confuse their own egos with God. The mystic cannot do that and succeed, because the mystic who does that can't succeed as a mystic. And therefore, there's a logic to people like even Arabi or Rumi or Abu Lafia um, or St. Francis of Assisi being open to the world around them that is not defined and confined by their own particular tradition because they have emptied themselves of ego in order to gain access to what they're seeking. And that becomes a kind of basis for understanding where Fethullah Gulen, as a Sufi, is coming from. And again, this is something I know that uh, Maggie will be addressing in greater detail. And the last essay, uh, which is an essay by Eileen Epig, Fethullah Gulen's care for all creation as a means to nonviolence, of course, carries this entire discussion of which different elements have been part of the previous seven essays out from what proves to be, in fact, too narrow a concern, only the human race. Because beginning with um, the passage found in, in the second surah, ayat 29 of the Quran, which is understood to empower humans at the same time, it, Im it imposes on us a responsibility to be the vice regents of God in um, continuing the process of morally and ethically ordering a universe, which after all at the outset is physically ordered very quickly by God, but who chooses for reasons we cannot know to leave the process of moral ordering in part to us as partners of God in that process. And Gulen's uh, interest in understanding that includes an understanding that extends beyond just the world of humans and our needs, but the world at large of which we play and can play and should play and must play an important part. If the world and in fact if we are to survive, all one has to do is all one has to do is look at today's New York Times and all the graffiti out in um, Arizona on those magnificent cacti by gangs of hooligans who clearly have no sense of respect for the world around them and don't recognize that you destroy the world, you destroy yourselves. 
So all of these essays, one way or, uh, one way or another, uh, are intended to meditate on the matter of the relationship among the issues of education and the development of a sense of the importance of nonviolence toward developing a sense of the importance of peace as um, the only solution to human being and being beyond human, both in this world and the other. And thank I'll you. turn the microphone to you, Maggie. Okay. Thank you very much, Ori, and thank you all for coming. And um, Ori is coming at this more from a philosophical approach, and I'm coming at it more from a practical approach. And even reading the essays, maybe what I take from them, or what I hone in on, is not exactly the same as he does. So hopefully, hearing both sides of the coin, which are complementary and go together, you're going to get a fuller picture, and I'm not going to repeat what he said. So I'm going to focus more on you know, what are some of the principles that are discussed in this book, and how are they applied in the Hizmet movement. Now, I actually met with the Hizmet movement in the late um, 1990s, but didn't know it. Really, my first formal introduction to Hizmet was in September 2008. I knew some of the Gulen movement then. I had read some of Fatullah Gulen's works, but um, I didn't really know Hizmet. And a local group took a few of us over to Turkey to learn about Hizmet. And this was September 2008. This was a formal introduction for me to Hizmet. And um, I know some of you in the room have been on these tours to Turkey. And they take, they show you the Hizmet institutions. We went to Zaman newspaper. We went to the Journalists and Writers Foundation. We visited Kims and Yokmu, which is an international aid organization. We visited Hizmet universities, um, primary schools, high schools. Uh, we met in people's homes. And one thing I understood right away is that this was not just an education movement. This was not a, an interfaith dialogue movement, although they do all those things. I understood this was a world peace movement and that they had in mind as their ultimate goal, nothing short of world peace. And, but you didn't really see the movement framed that way so much. Although now you see it being framed more as a peace movement. In 2010, we had a book come out with Esposito and Neil Moss, another edited volume about Islam and peace building. So and our book explicitly talks about this as a peace building movement. And as I hope you all know, and will come in October, the Rumi Forum, along with uh, other institutions, including yours, are hosting a conference on Islam and peace building and global case studies. So, so this is how we're talking about the Hizmet movement as a peace movement. And the other thing that was really remarkable to me and that struck me as a sociologist is the long time horizon of the Hizmet movement. I mean, what are they doing? <laughs> they're going out, they're starting with a young person and educating them, and educating them in a particular way to hope that they will grow up, <laughs> they will become moral leaders in their country, more leaders that are moral in their country, and that are going to influence policies according to universal human values. I mean, this is really a long time, time horizon. And they're in more than 130 countries now, and you think, Wow, I mean, who is doing this? I mean, the other thing that's very unique among Islamic movements about the Glenn movement is this big focus on practice. It's not enough. In fact, even Glenn would say that it's not right to just purify yourself, to become a better human being. You have to do this in order to be able to serve humanity. That's the point. So, and you have a lot of young people involved in this movement, and maybe they're not going to see the ripest fruits of this movement in their lifetime, even. I mean, it would be great if we had a world peace. Certainly, there are definite effects you can see of the movement 
um, immediate, short term, but the long term ultimate. And if we look back the 80s and 90s, uh, when I was a young professor and going to graduate school, there was a big movement to do evaluation research and outcome-based research and measuring, you know, what is the outcome of your program? And even I was listening to the Diane Rehm show a couple of weeks ago. They had the president of the World Bank on there, and he, in response to a caller question, said, you know, we have a really remarkably well-developed way to measure the effectiveness of our programs. And you can see that, that all programs, it's tied to their funding, they have to demonstrate their effectiveness. And this has some positive attributes, but it also gives a short time horizon to the way uh, that these programs are conducted. You gotta, we want, and this is the American way too, right? We want results, <laughs> we want them now, <laughs> and we want to measure them. Well, the Glenn Movement doesn't operate in that paradigm. It's a grassroots movement. So, because when you're doing that re short-term results, what is the thing in? You're going to come in, say, I know the best way to get the short-term results and impose your program in a top-down way. But because they take this approach, they're able to approach their programs in a very grassroots way. And so when we're talking grassroots, we're talking at the individual level. And when we go like individual level, even more inside the individual, the real grassroots is transforming the heart. And it's through transforming the heart that society becomes transformed. And this is a theme you see repeated throughout this book and throughout the Glenn movement and through his ideas, these ideas of transforming your heart, purifying yourself. It always starts with yourself first. And these are, you know, part of the Sufi ideas that are prevalent and discussed amongst the essayists here. And this is the essential Rumi of wisdom when he wrote, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. So, you know, why this book? This uh, book illuminates some of these core philosophies, this kind of approach to peace building. And I want to talk about some of these principles. The first general principle, commonality among all human beings and the responsibility we have for each other and the natural world around us. And this, and Ori talked about this. You know, first we have to realize our essential nature, our value. And uh, because he explained to me, he said, look, growing up in Turkey, we didn't think good about the Russian people. When adults would talk about Russia, they would say, you know, they're our enemy. So I was kind of apprehensive about going. So anyway, he went, and you can imagine, he's never been out of the country before, he's never flown an airplane before, uh, but he's going to go abroad to um, what he's been told is the land of his enemy to share his Islamic knowledge. And, and he didn't know it, uh, where he was going to exactly end up. And he realized later he was very lucky in his assignment. And he said when he got there, he realized that the Turkish people were wrong. He said that the Russian people are people first. And you can continue, he said, you can't continue with hatred and enmity. You have to look at them and know them. When I met with the Russian people, I changed my mind. There are many good people with good habits and good character. It was a very good experience for me. Good for my horizons and my ideas. His mitt taught me, you have to be positive for everybody. I used this principle to communicate with the Russian people and it was very successful. I couldn't see any problems between them and me. And a secondary point here, a related principle, is his mitt members themselves are pushed towards constant self-improvement. So he was still, uh, working on, on his feelings. So in their interactions, they have to act through love, acceptance, compassion. And this, of course, is a Quranic principle as in the stated well-known verse that I have made you different tribes so that you may know one another, not despise each other. And what is this knowing? As already talked about, it's a recognition that we all come from one source. And uh, diversity is to be valued. And this is a common sentiment among his members. And they use this as a way to draw upon. I mean, he didn't even speak Russian. So he's, and there were a lot of Tartars there. 
And at the madrasa where he was teaching, there were uh, Tartars and Bashkirs, and he said, in 20 days, I became a Tartar. He, and he was speaking the language. So, um, so the second broad principle, and Ori talks about this in one of his chapters, is you put individuals in the schools on purpose, they uh, have students from different backgrounds. So if you go to school in Nigeria, you're going to see Christians and Muslims in the same school. And this is kind of unusual in Nigeria. So, um, and they're supported. I have a beautiful Nigerian story. Unfortunately, you cannot hear it today. But <laughs> yeah, because we want to finish up in just a couple <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and uh, so, Anofa, you would have Tartar, Bashkir, and Russian students together. And a fairly typical statement that comes up in my interviews, at some point the principal or, or the teacher will say, you know, the parents outside the school are fighting, but their children are friends in the school. You see, they're creating this culture of love and tolerance. And how does this ex happen? Um, uh, th so this Abhi said, I saw some problems between Tartar and Russian people. Their language and culture are almost the same, but during the Russian Federation, they had a big problem. Nationalism became a big problem. And of course, we saw all the eruptions that happened. So at that time, Ufa had about five million people, two million Russians, one and a half million Tartar, about a million Bashkir. And between the Tartar and Bashkir students, we had problems, there were conflicts, they didn't like each other. But say, these are students studying to become Imams. And he didn't know it, where he was going, but that madrasa, this is where the mufti for the Rus Russian Federation was headquartered. This was the madrasa that was teaching all the imams for the entire <laughs> Russian Federation. <laughs> and they were getting their Islamic knowledge from this 20-year-old non-theology student, not huh. yet theology student graduate, you see. Um, so anyway, he said, oh, he found a sympathetic Tartar student and talked to him, a Bashkir student talked to him, shared his ideas and said, look, I want you guys to live with me. And he, they rented a house, they lived together. So they just became an example of tolerance, cooperation and love for the other imams or future imams sitting there at the school that yes, we can get along, we can come across our common humanity. And they lived together for a year. And he said that we didn't have any problems between us. but. But see the effort. <laughs> you know, what kind of world peace program? He's got two individuals. He's living with them for a year. And they're, like, transformed by the experience. And I'm sure there are a lot of ripple effects from that. Uh, and they, those two brothers, they went on to also serve in his med. And I'm sure there were a lot of ripple effects that came out. But this is, like, a very kind of intense one-on-one -on -one learning, changing, transforming your whole, your um, character, refining yourself. I want to start, I'll start with the first question and so you can get your uh, thoughts together. Uh, Ori, I'd, I'd like to start with you with thinking about the comment that you made in your chapter that Thomas Merton had difficulty uh, being part of a completely interfaith mysticism because of the exclusivity of Christianity. Is, uh, would, would you see exclusivity as one of the examples of ego that, uh, th that a mystic needs to, over the, that this uh, kind of interfaith mysticism needs to really address uh, specifically? Sure. Two, two, two parts to my response. One, um, Merton, I think, was, was changing. Um, and it, it is interesting that the change was coming first by way of finding commonalities between his own tradition and traditions which were much further from his own, mm -hmm. um, Southeast Asian Buddhist traditions, um, than Judaism or Islam are. Um, it was easier for him to look all the way over there than to look right over here in terms of theology. But I, I, I think had he lived, uh, he might have come around to that because that's the direction it seems to me in, in, in which he was moving. Uh, as for the, the, the general principle, um, I guess my answer is pretty simply and straightforwardly yes. It, it, it's, it's paradoxic. Um, 
by definition, religion addresses a reality that is not ours. God is not what we are, uh, or God would be us. And yet, paradoxically, certainly in the Abrahamic traditions in very specific ways, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all understand that there is a bit of the divine in all of us. It's the soul that is within us, that intangible whatever it is that makes us what we are, that connects us to divinity. And in that sense, there is a way in which we are like God and God is like us, even as by definition God is utterly other than what we are. So the problem is if I don't understand that I cannot understand God the way I understand that 2 plus 2 equals 4, if I cannot point God out the way I can point out a chair which I can access with my senses, then I run into the complication of um, mistaking my understanding of God for God's understanding of God. And I have no way of knowing that. I can only by faith know that. And faith works for each of us in his or her own way. And the mystic understands that. The mystic recognizes that it's something ultimately I have to do myself, but my goal has to be not to get there, but to get there and come back and improve the world as a consequence of the experience. And the experience, you know, there are two different terms that are used to refer to the mystical experience. One is ecstasy, right? Ekstasis in, Greece, in Greek means to be outside your ordinary state of being. But the term that is not as often used, but which is just as important, is enstasy. Enstasis means to be not outside of, but to be deeply within your ordinary state of being. The God that I'm looking for that is out there is also in here. It's a matter of how I find it and recognize it. It, not me, but the God that is within me. And that then has repercussions. Gulen talks about, um, and he's following a tradition that goes back centuries within Sufism in particular, that uh, all the way back to the Quran, you don't hate the individual who is hateful. You hate what the individual does that is hateful. You hate the hateful act. You don't hate the individual who is acting hatefully. Um, and conversely, ultimately what you embrace in other individuals is the manifestation of godness within them, within everybody, within everything. And that's what you have to find in order to be embracing. But you can't do that if your ego gets in the way. If my understanding is the only correct understanding, there's the emphasis, my, M-Y, that's ego. And the paradox is to be comfortable not having to assert my understanding is the only correct understanding and not feeling that somehow I've just created a, a kind of uh, proposition and policy of relativism where everything is equally the same and, and nothing is particular. That's not it. Mine is particular, but its particularity is to me and I have to be comfortable also realizing that your particularity may work for you as mine does for me. And mine is better than yours for me, but yours may be better than mine for you. And that doesn't really mean, you see, it's a paradox. But if we're dealing with a reality which is not our own, for God there's not up and down and in and out and east and west and north and south because it's a reality without the spatial components that are part of our reality. And I would just add, Do it. just very yeah. short on a practical level, that, uh, you know, one of the basic principles of doing dialogue is that you focus on commonalities because mm -hmm. we have a lot of, of things among the religions that are common. And so this is kind of the principle of way to reach out and connect. And if I may, I want to make one very important point for those that maybe are not so familiar with the Hizmet movement. The example I gave was about this Abhi going to teach at a madrasa. This was not a school established by Hizmet. And at the beginning of the movement, they were asked to provide this kind of religious education by countries because they, they needed it desperately. 
but the actual schools that were started by the Golan movement and have been started in over 130 countries, these are not madrasas in any shape or form of the word. They are secular schools and uh, no religion is taught unless that particular country mandates it. Certain countries mandate uh, religious education like N Nigeria does. But, and so they follow the state mandate in whatever country they are. But the schools are secular and I just want to you know, make sure everybody is clear on that. I'd, I'd like to kind of follow up with the end of where you were, or, or in, in the service to others, right. part of the coming back of the service to others. And, and Maggie, maybe, maybe you can speak to this in terms of, uh, as a sociologist, um, Max Weber said that the state is the one that holds the monopoly on power and on violence. And so uh, how, do, uh, how do we, as we come out in service to others in, in our topic, in the topic of peace, h how do we respond then to states that are uh, not just or that, uh, uh, how do we serve others if the state is not doing the right thing by the, the people that live under, under that state? Well, I mean, the global movement approach is basically, you know, as much as they can, they conform. They're not like an oppositional movement. So they go into a country, they're going to conform to the uh, laws and rules of that country. They're including and in Turkey itself where it began. Right. right. All the schools are done according to the state mandated canons, right? Right. So, um, so that's kind of the approach they take. Now, some of these uh, authoritarian countries have, like, including the example I gave, has chosen not to renew contracts with the Glenn movement, I think for this very reason. I mean, when you are uh, educating somebody, you're, you are affecting their values and who they are, and sometimes states perceive that as a threat. So this is a challenge. But, you know, Weber also wrote The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and this is all about or one of the themes about your values and how you live your life kind of transforming the society. And so I think, you know, maybe a Hizmet person might answer that question is that we still have to keep doing the work. So this is what they're doing, but we have to keep doing our work. Mm -hmm. And that's the approach that they always take. Okay, so maybe we can't directly affect that domain, but we, we have our duty, and we're going to do our duty. Hmm. Thank you. Right, we have time for a couple of questions, if there's people. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to put a mic. Um, hmm. It's a full yeah. camera only, it's not going to give you a shot. Okay, this is uh, Preston Hughes, and I just wanted to ask uh, if then the Gulen movement, the Hizmet movement, is primarily a force for peace, then is it primarily an a-religious movement, uh, or is religion, or a particular religion, more important than the other? So this is the paradox of the Glenn movement. You could say paradox. The Glenn movement members themselves, the volunteers, are highly religious people. Of all but religions? It's pr they're predominantly, predominantly Muslims. Muslim. Okay, they're coming out of Turkey. It's a Muslim country. Galen's Muslim. He's a Muslim Sufi. They're primarily Muslims. So, but I mean, there's no formal membership in the Galen movement, and that's coming out of the specific historical uh, context in Turkey. You know, we can talk about that a long time. But um, so they themselves are some of the most like I don't know clean. <laughs> ethically pure people you're going to meet anywhere in the world. But in their work, they're not evangelizing. It's in no way an evangelical movement. It's in no way a proselytizing movement. Even I would say it's like verbatim to do that. You see, because they're working with all, and this is the part talk I didn't get to talk about, so thanks <laughs> for asking. They're working with uh, people all over the world. And the thing about Glenn, or Hoja Fendi, as his followers call them, is that he, and he's reading the time that he's living in. And we're living in a global era with diverse cultures. And so it's more like this idea of peaceful coexistence. 
And in fact, I went to a conference in Nigeria, which is desperately in need. And that was the theme of the conference there, peaceful coexistence. Given, you know, we're all standing in our own cultures, languages, faith traditions, you know, how can we get along? That's where they're coming from. May I just reinforce that? Um, Gulen in his writings makes it clear that he believes that one is best off as a kind of spiritual being, but he also is clear that what a particular individual's configuration for that spiritual being is will be his or her stepping off point toward being part of improving the world. So his point is, if you're Muslim, you should be a Muslim. If you're Jewish, you should be a Jew. If you're Christian, you should be a Christian, and so on and so on and so forth, as opposed to having as some kind of a point or purpose to convince others to become what you are. And uh, as Maggie said, you go into Gulen schools, religion isn't being taught. Proselytization is not going on. Actions, which are the actions of teaching people to be better people, is what's going on on all kinds of levels. But without that kind of specificity that could be construed in any way as evangelical. I'd like to follow that up with the thinking that the purpose of education is to teach tolerance and service to others. Mm -hmm. is that, then can those be taught without a religious or faith foundation to them? Or, or can, they, uh, they, can they just be abstracted? Is that part of what uh, Gulen would well, share? Well, I, th I think his personal preference would be through some form of religion, but he also, as Maggie says, recognized that in, in today's world um, there are different shapes that people take spiritually, including the shape of being driven without the idea of a, a metaphysical superstructure behind mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean that you cannot be moral, you cannot be ethical, you cannot be altruistic. That's a word he uses all the time. Um, the Hizmet movement is an altruism movement. It's altruistic service. Altruism is doing things for others, not because of what you're going to get out of it, but because you are obligated to do things for others. And whether that is because of a metaphysical superstructure or not would be less important, I think, to him than that you are doing that. The thing is, is that like the <coughs> Hizmet members are kind of, you could say, trained or self-discipline themselves towards acceptance. So they're, when they're approaching other human beings, they're approaching with um, this kind of atmosphere of acceptance. And this, I think, is what has allowed them to go into so many different countries and cultures, is because they're not coming in there and saying, you're doing this wrong, you need to do it this way, or our way is the best. They're coming in there like with an attitude of service. I would like to ask a question about the Hizmet Movement and its idea of um, injustice, standing up to injustice. Uh, there's a lot of talk about service, but um, if, you are if you are confronting <coughs> excuse me, uh, a power, that, uh, so somebody or a group that is abusing you because of their power, uh, how does the Hizmet Movement say you should respond to this if we're supposed to be serving people? Um, I think of the Gaza flotilla as one example. I know that people in the Hizmet movement in Turkey had different opinions about that, that uh, action, but I'd just like to know what your ideas about injustice and uh, the, re there's the response to injustice in the Hizmet movement. Do you want to go first? Well, I guess they would say, I mean, I, I can't speak for the Hizmet movement, but you know, from what I read, I would, I would guess they would say everything, and you can read, um, you can go online and read um, Glenn's statements about the flotilla and all of that, is that, you know, everything requires its own methods. And his one's always going to go for the one that's going to cause the least conflict and the least harm. And that means maybe it's a more difficult or something's going to take longer time 
But this is kind of maybe like a general idea of philosophy, how they're going to approach. So. I get um, But even like, okay, then, you know, the Prime Minister in Turkey was here a couple of weeks ago, and his Deputy Prime Minister met with uh, Fatul Gulen. This is reporting in the press, as I'm getting my information from the press here on this. And, and um, you know, he said that, Gulen said, you know, you guys are doing some things well, but other things maybe, you know, you can improve on. He didn't specify what they were, but we can all kind of guess. Um, you know, and so it's like addressing, but in his own way. And uh, anyway, um, I, I, and I would I would just supplement that with, um, I mean, this book and this evening is it largely about nonviolence. So the question becomes how to confront injustice, and you can do so in nonviolent ways or, or violent ways. And Gulen would certainly not approve, and the, the Hizmet movement would not approve of violent means of confronting injustice. Um, an important point, I think, that Maggie made both in her presentation and just now in her response has to do with time horizons and the matter of patience. If ultimately my plan is to educate people, I, the Hizmet movement, um, toward thinking along uh, the lines of a different sort of paradigm of being in the world, I can expect results immediately. And I am going to find injustice that I cannot reverse immediately, or maybe in two generations, because it won't be until the third, that that, that sort of injustice will be reversed. But that issue of patience and that issue of Functioning within a nonviolent framework is, I think, endemic to the way the movement thinks. Well, our time is up, and uh, a good place to stop. I want to thank both uh, Ori and Margaret for sharing this and for the work that you did and putting together this uh, wonderful book. And uh, thank all of you for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you.